Oh, good. All right. So thanks everybody for attending. And again, we are ideas. And what we do is we're trying to get the community together, whether it has big data, data science, AI, and now even blockchain, and just come together as a whole and just share our ideas, share our knowledge, share our insights with each other. So that's our main goal, main values, and our co core mission. And about a little bit about us, what we do as a company, we're a nonprofit, and we do a lot of conferences throughout the United States, and we also do some in China. We have our own certificate, we have workshops, and right now we're doing these online webinars, and we also have some mentorship programs. We're super new. We just started a few years ago in February 2016, and we're growing a lot now thanks to all of you guys, LinkedIn, and all of these connections we've made. And this is just some of the past and most recent conferences we've been to. Our next one's gonna be in New York, which is gonna be a blockchain conference and or hackathon. So if, if you're in the New York area, come through. We're more than happy to have you. And for the certificates, we offer SQL, R, Python, recommendation systems, and NLP. And other than that, we also have some boot camps on our own. We have Kyle Polich, if you guys know him, he's from Data Skeptic. He's one of our instructors. Also, Jason Gang, who is the manager of Ideas, and Peter, who is a postdoc researcher in USC. Other than that, this is our website. Feel free to check it out or email us any question that you may have. And let's begin. So again, I want you guys to leave all of your questions on the QA box or through message. So this is a Q&A panel. We'll answer as many questions as you guys can for the next hour. And let's begin. And again, Nick, can you introduce yourself? Um, yeah, sure. I'm uh, Nick Ryan. I've been doing data science for a while before it was actually a thing. Um, I, I've worked, uh, I originally trained as an actuary, but then uh, fell into sort of data science through predictive modeling um, of auto insurance and that sort of thing. Um, but right now I'm, um, yeah, I, I've worked, bounced around between Sydney and Melbourne and like I'm, I'm working remotely for a, a, a startup company, technical advice for another startup, a bit of consulting and um, yeah, it's that sort of stuff. And um, Happy to help you guys out with anything I can. Um, big fan of Randy. Big fan of Randy for a long time. <laughs> big Honestly. fan of Nick. Big fan. Oh, come on. <laughs> if you guys haven't followed Nick yet, please do. It's Nick Ryan on LinkedIn. So please. <laughs> and that's the first thing you should do. Please follow him. Uh, what, what you've been doing for the community has been absolutely superb, honestly. It's, it's been outstanding. It's been uh, thank you. for others. And uh, like, yeah, I just. Yeah, definitely. Out. So if you guys have any questions, leave it in the question box, Q&A box in the middle, or just leave a message here. So any question about data science, machine learning, or anything about the field, job searches, advice, we're here to help. I can even just start. If you want me just to do yeah, like if you can. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of, um, some of the questions that, that I tend to get asked are, are like what sort of skills people need to get into into data science and um you know what do i need to learn and how do i become a, a data scientist and and for people i just advise like have a look at some some jobs that are around have a look if anything looks interesting take a data driven approach have a look at five or six jobs and what they're looking for and you can then sort of work backwards to to get your, the skills that you need for those particular jobs and so what you're going to see are common elements like they're going to want a scripting language like r or python they're going to want some some sql because all the data is going to be stored in the database and they're going to want you to be able to do some basic like some data manipulation some plotting some exploratory type stuff and um yeah that, that's that's it for, for a lot of the jobs but depending on where, where you go like you know if you whatever you're interested in is you know, work yeah. yeah okay so we have some questions incoming and i'll just read them off to you Cool. All right. So from Anor, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, he or she said, so what can you say about feature engineering? About feature engineering in, yeah. in general? Like, yeah, um, it's very general. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> really general question. Yeah, it, it's, it's a good thing to, to do. Um, 
what I, it, it needs to be explainable. Like, so here's the thing, right? Um, it depends, it depends often on the context of your problem, but often if you're explaining the results of a model to like mm-hmm. executives and, and stuff, and you've got this weird, crazy feature that you've somehow like dreamt up, they're maybe not going to get it. I'm coming from insurance and banking where those sorts of things, ex- explanations, they'll, they'll ask questions like, what is this yeah. actually? And so things like the number of credit inquiries in the last six months as a feature, that's something you can engineer. And that's something that does mm-hmm. make sense in the context of that particular problem. So in, in that kind of sense, sense, when you're building up ratios or if you're building up like different uh, features like that, then, then ab- absolutely like go ahead and do those, those features. In some other uh, spaces where you're not so worried about the interpretation of the results, you can go all kinds of crazy with your feature engineering. Or in, in, but uh, you know, for, for some other applications as well, like deep learning, you just chuck everything in, you see what comes out. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and, and so it depends again on the context and what you're doing as to where, how important feature engineering would be. But mm. definitely in, in those sorts of settings of like, oh, I'm, I'm looking at predicting like a, a credit risk or I'm looking at insurance claims, then feature engineering will be quite important for yeah. giving the model a boost and also for the common sense checks and also kind of trying to rep- replicate the decision making that like a, a human would do in that, in that particular setting. So then so, it becomes important. Okay, so basically, so given your data set, correct? You have a list of features that are you, you're going to use for your model. Yes. And so what feature engineering is based off of your context is using your existing features to create new features. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. At the high level, that's, that's exactly right. And okay. Got it. And to, ex, and to have these, these features that mean something to, to the, the business or to the person interpreting the model. And I use the classic one of looking at credit inquiries or number of defaults in the last X months or X mm-hmm. And that's, that's a great one. Or ratio, like long yeah. to value ratio as a feature, like, you know, that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. yeah, that would be a ratio. And that All makes right. sense. Yeah. We have another question from, hopefully I say this correctly, Tala Narya. He or she said, I want to find projects from the w- real world where I can work together with a group. What opportunities are there for that? Yeah. Uh, working... Here's, here's what I think. Um, if you have something that you're quite passionate about and something that you love and you apply that data science type uh, techniques to that, you get a real buzz out of doing it. So, mm. and the, the less you have sort of domain expertise about a certain problem, the harder it is for you to get pumped and excited about it. And if you have all those connections, like say you're working in digital marketing or something like that, and you've, you've, you know the domain, you know the problems, and you know some people, then it makes sense to be able to try to target those particular problems and to get people on board that way. Yeah. And anything that's sort of outside what you know, the, the chances, and this is just a general thing, like not just in, in terms of this, but in terms of if you're trying to start a company or if you're trying to do something new, anything that's kind of outside what you know, it does have a chance of success, but it's diminishing chance of success the further mm. out. So I would, I would say, look at um, the people around you, look at what they're interested in. I don't know if you're working or not working, but if you are working, what field is it? Maybe you can get your colleagues or, or yeah. people you know, together to do it. But if, if you're a student, then I'd just say, like, it's a college environment. People want to learn. Jump on Kaggle, grab a, grab yeah, a problem. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, yeah. So Nick brought up Kaggle, and I really want to emphasize that as well. So again, especially if you don't have anybody around or if you're shy or if you don't know anybody, Kaggle is really great because you're there for one mission. Everybody that on, everybody's there on that platform for data science or machine learning. And what they offer is a lot of competitions and data sets that you can work on. So a lot of people are out there in the discussion forums. They're asking for teammates. And you can use that to actually call for help or just call for any teams, and you'll be surprised how many of them are gonna come and work with you. All right, so we have another question from Anor. Given the legacy system of a company, so like raw, raw dirty data, big company, 50 plus years in the field of assurance, you are, <laughs> you, are, you are required to build a data team and do magic. Briefly, how many people you will start with, 
what would you start with? What are your first steps? And how would you organize the team? Wow, that's, that's kind of huge. Um, I, I, would, I would say that like when, you, when you're eating an elephant, right, you start mm -hmm. off with small, small bites. Like, you, know, you just don't bite it. Um, yeah. I, I believe that there is an increasing sort of sophistication, that, that there's a spectrum of analytics and data science for a company. And so the very first step is, again, like the, the analytic pipelines and the systems, getting them right, and then allowing, you know, reporting of KPIs and dashboards and, and, mm -hmm. and AI before then, then doing some predictive stuff, before then doing some machine learning. And so you really need to step it out in that sort of a fashion. So you can't just throw in a bunch of PhDs and have these crappy legacy systems and trying mm -hmm. to make some magic if the infrastructure isn't there. And so I, I would say that it's, it's that way. And, and even just to get a reliable number out of a company is quite hard for like, you know, maybe, maybe it's like a measure of profitability and what does profit mean to the business and does it mean different things to different people and getting mm -hmm. you know, regular dashboards, regular reporting, regular KPIs. We want to hit this number. What's the number? That sort of stuff needs to come first before the data team. So it, it, it's an evolution. It's, it's not something you can turn on overnight unless you've got, lots and lots and lots of money which most yeah <laughs> so the first thing would be to get a team of like you know a reporting team or well, first of all would be the, the the architects to get the um the pipelines happening and then that mm -hmm. would be a, that might be six months and then it would be the the reporting team would come in next and then as the the data in the organization matures and and the, it's data driven kind of approach and has to be led by a, a leader, you have to have board representation as well. Otherwise, mm -hmm. these don't fail. Well. So you do need to be able to have the right people as well, the right managers and ex execs to be able to buy into it. Otherwise, the thing doesn't work. So it, it, it will be an evolution over a long period of time. So to, to answer with a number of people, mm -hmm. I, I, it would depend on the company. It depends on the data. It depends on so much. But it needs to be staggered over a, a, a period of time. Got it. We have another question from Ina. So good evening. I want to know that does the academic background or marks, does that affect our job search or is it just the skills which matter? I think it depends on the country. Like, I mean, and, and there are some countries where the, the academics seem to matter a lot more. And just from what I've seen mm -hmm. in different job searches, it's like you need to have a master's, you need to have a PhD. I mean, they say that, whether they mean that or not, I'm not really sure. Me personally, if I'm hiring someone, I don't care if they haven't finished high school. Like, I don't yeah. care. If they're at all. Like, if they can do the work and they can do the problem, they get, they, they, they get hired. Like, I, I really don't yeah. mind. Like, I, I work with people, um, I'm sort of working with the dev team. And the, the guy in charge of it, he's got a degree in classic, like, literature, like, you know, and wow. uh, okay. one, one of the best devs I've ever worked with, you know, uh, finished, finished high school and that was it. Like, yeah. you know, after that. So, to me, it doesn't matter at all. And some of the best people I've ever worked with are totally uncredentials because they have yeah. the passion to do it. Yeah. Um, but not everyone feels the same way I do, and that's really unfortunate because I do feel that people... <laughs> able to have a go based on merit and um, based on what they can, they, they can do. And, mm. and the projects. so it, it does depend on a lot of things. And I don't know what it's like in, in, in India, or I don't know what it's like in, in the, the USA, but um, certainly and different, different people will, will, will want different things and expect different things. Got it. Um, we have a question from Paramel. So for someone who has graduated with a business analytics degree, with a lot of banking and credit experience, how can I break through the job market? I'm assuming data science as where, so whenever I'm applying, I don't get recognized or even get a phone interview. What am I doing wrong? Uh, Randy, I mean, you, you could probably answer, answer this, you know, even better than me. Like we were just talking about yeah. uh, uh, the, the power of the network. Yeah, yeah, yes. So again, with, with all with Nick Ryan saying, if you're not getting any sort of feedback or response from like your, your job search, it's either one of two things. One, it's maybe your resume is not well prepared, not drafted properly, not ordered properly. And that's not giving you to your second step with HR. So that's step one. Step two is either you're not connecting with the right people. And I think this is very underutilized. A lot of the people that I talk to in data science or just any jobs, 
a lot of the time that they get the job is from second or third party connections. It's those people that you know that gives you that leverage and that opportunity for you to get into the door. So my best advice, whether that's LinkedIn, whether that's um, Facebook groups, any social media groups like Reddit, Quora, um, or again, like these conferences, the whole value of networking goes beyond just building a relationship with people. It gives you those opportunities that you may not even know exist. So that's, that's my say. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And I think from my own personal experience, I, I, the last four, maybe five jobs have just been people tapping me on the shoulder, people I know, or, mm. or friends or people I know. So I haven't had to actually like, apply for jobs in a long time. Like it, it's just the, the network. It's just people who know you and yeah. you know, and that's, that's it. So if you can get it to that stage where the jobs are coming to you rather than you coming to the jobs, that's exactly where you want to be. And so that's, that's the meetup events, that's being active on LinkedIn, that's connecting with different people. I mean, have coffee with people. Just go and chat to yeah. people and, and don't, don't sort of beg them. Don't be like, oh, but just, hey, what are you doing? Like, I'm interested in data science. Can you give me some tips? You know, I'm, yeah. I'm really kind of with you. And, and it's like the power of the coffee catch-up. Coffee catch-up. <laughs> I like that. And I also <laughs> like to add too, so if you're ever utilizing LinkedIn for like the job search, remember this. Whenever you're trying to get a job and you're trying to ask for help, it's never going to be a lose win or a win lose for, uh, connection. It's always going to be a win win. What can you provide to them and what can they provide to you? So in this case, a good approach would be to do your homework on the company, look at the position that's open and understand what type of problems they're going through. Or maybe you can look up the existing team members of that position and look up their current skills and study that. Learn what type of skills are needed and that gives you a better leverage for you for that job. You can talk about it. So that's another LinkedIn tip. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we have another question um, from Jennifer. I've been a marketing data analyst for 12 plus years using SQL, SAS, Tableau in the finance, advertising, business, healthcare space. What skills slash experience do I need before I can call myself a data scientist? Well, I, I think the thing that separates like a, a data analyst from a data scientist, I think really is the, um, the, the programming chops, like how, how, how much you, how confident you are with code. Mm -hmm. and, and even in the, the marketing space, maybe some natural language processing type stuff of, and of unstructured text. And, and that, that kind of thing. Uh, there are a couple, there is a, a MOOC, that, a Coursera MOOC, that's, uh, the name of it's escaped me, but that is um, based on like social media marketing type um, analysis and, and they use R and Python in that. So I'd say probably command of a, a, a scripting language is, is mm -hmm. going to really help you. Um, but I see um, like marketing data analytics as being a space that's going to be huge for data scientists and data, data scientists with yeah. um, in, in unstructured text in the next few years. Um, I, I think at, at the moment there's there's a real um, lack of, of people in that space. Yeah. And I think they're going to be screaming out pretty soon for a lot of people that can do a lot of cool stuff in, in mm -hmm. uh, uh, data analytics. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd say probably... Yeah, and, you know, once you're confident pulling data out of Twitter or Facebook and doing some, uh, some unstructured text and analysis on that, you can really start to, to mm -hmm. talk it out. Um, it. Cool. Um, another question from Tuhi. So this is a very, a very popular one. Can you tell me the difference between data science and data analysts, their tasks slash background? Yeah, so I think we kind of hit it a bit just then, um, and, and again, you may or may not, feel free to argue with me, Randy, but I, I, I say that um, <laughs> yeah. for a, a data analyst, you're, you may, you're still working with, with data, you've, you've got some SQL scripts that you run, you may be mm -hmm. doing some of your reporting in Excel, and you may be still getting some, some insights, but it's kind of static, it's kind of reporting, it's, it's yeah. that type of stuff. Whereas with a, a data scientist, you, you're sort of more forward looking and it's more getting into that more predictive sort of space. Mm -hmm. And you have more uh, command of, of like scripting languages, like, mm -hmm. uh, and you're kind of able to be able to, to do more of that sort of stuff 
yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes with a, a, a data analyst, you may need a developer to help you with the SQL scripts and that sort of stuff to be able to extract data. Um, data scientists start to become more independent doing that. Yeah, kind of stuff. I like so that. It's mm -hmm. a little bit of an evolution. I, I do see it as an evolution. And there's nothing wrong with being a, a data analyst at all mm -hmm. because some of the, the insights that, that they have can really drive tremendous value. And, and yeah. it's often forgotten that um, some of those key insights, really like, even simple stuff, like who are my top five or six customers that can account for 80% of my business? Mm -hmm. It's important to know. And a lot of places can't tell you that. So yeah, um, yeah there's value in both. Yeah, I would like to add to what Nick said, especially with the independent part. So I, I think what's lacking with like the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist, correct me if I'm wrong again, I think it's more of like an upgrade to a data scientist. And again, for a data scientist, I think data analyst is the backbone core of what data science is, analyzing the data. But what another skill that's differentiated between a data analyst is, again, being more independent in regards to the whole data process, the whole data pipeline. So data science includes you having a good understanding on how to collect your data, knowing what data to collect, knowing how to clean, pre-process, clean your data accordingly, um, knowing how to like explore your data through visualizations, make charts, graphs. And then uh, the next part, the next level is knowing how to apply your different machine learning models to it, create predictions. And then again, just reporting your results. So it's a whole process. Yeah. And okay, so this is from Anonymous. Um, how about data science and geography and geospatial data? Is it a good opportunity in the future? Yeah, I, I think so. Like, I, I really do think so. One of the things that I did very early on in my career, and you know, we were really scratching the, the surface of this way back when, was mm -hmm. um, in insurance looking at um, like, oh, cyclone risk, flood risk and fire risk and creating these like rating zones and stuff like that. And also looking at fire and, and theft and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. pretty much working out that if you, if you were near a train station, you're in trouble because someone's going to steal your car and that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> so, and, and, yeah, I, I do think that there are some really good insights you can get by overlaying your data like on, on a map. And, yeah. And, you know, GG map and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, pretty, pretty good for doing that in, in R, and that's the, what I tended to use in, 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 the, in the past to do that stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I really think there's, um, there's a lot, and, and you don't see it all that much out, out in the wild, or I, I haven't really seen it all that much. I guess, you know, dealing with startups, um, you know, the, some of the data sets are a little bit smaller and you don't really care so much about like what's happening across the country but um yeah, but yeah I, I think it's it, it's absolutely huge and it's really interesting to be able to apply spatial smoothing to things like rating zones and be able to identify hot spots mm -hmm. um, and yeah that and if that can influence your your marketing strategy or if, if that can influence like you know how, how many people you allocate to certain sales in different areas and that sort of stuff that's all really interesting stuff and so yeah, yeah there, there should be more, more of it and there, there probably is a lot happening in other companies Got it. Um, for a while all right, we have one from Y Chan. Oh, I see you all the time on LinkedIn. Nice to meet you here. So I recognize your name. She said, what do you think about pursuing a master's degree in data science? More and more schools are having these programs. And in your opinion, are these programs good now or do they, do they need more time to catch up? Um, <clears throat> I think it depends on um, the, again, the, the, the country that you're in and mm -hmm. the quality of the, the education. So if you were to, I mean, if I lived in, in the States, then uh, that would just be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you'd go, go to Stanford or something like that and it would just be wow. Well. But the, the quality of the education online, because like, I, I thought, honestly thought about doing this as well. I, a few mm -hmm. years ago, I thought oh, I'd do a master in computer science, do a master in data science but I, I looked at the quality of the online offerings i looked at the cost and i looked at the fact over here at least in australia that people don't really care that much generally about you mm -hmm. about doing the work and especially for me in my my stage now i'm a bit older um I, it's probably not so important um but it, it depends on if they if they do say like you know we've wanted the minimum a master's then you've got to get a master's right? yeah. <laughs> gotta, yeah that's <laughs> dumb yeah that's the company um, but if you if you're looking at these different jobs, and so you have a look at five or six jobs that are of interest to you, and if if you're checking them out, and it's like okay, we just 
want you know a scripting language we want um sql we want then you, you probably don't need it and you know mm. but if if you're a student and you, you haven't had any work experience then it, it may put your head of other people so it could be a good thing in that way yeah um but if you're someone who's already working and had the experience it may not be as important to you rather than having some projects and a good work history mm -hmm. And then I have my say a little bit on that. Again, it really depends on the school. So data, again, data science is very new. And now a lot of schools are trying to catch up by having these courses in the first place. So um, it's really up to you to do your research and get as, much, as many reviews as you can before you even decide to do it. And also too, um, since data science is so new, these data scientists before, they haven't had those existing data science um, uh, masters in the first place. They got their jobs it's either mostly through learning on their own. That's why I think most of the data science are at. They are self-taught and by self-taught again all the information is out there online and it's up to you to figure out what you need to do and through these webinars like right here taking whatever you want out of this and applying it to yourself. And okay so we have another question from Aisha. She said so when we think of working on projects, the ones we find on the web are very common. I don't think companies would find us ex exceptional if we do it. How do we make sure that we do something unique? Well, I think you can still um, find like a, a class of problem that you're interested in mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, but for me, like, you know, it could be something, you know, quite novel, like trying to recognize if someone's wearing a seatbelt or not, like, you know, basically. <laughs> Yeah, that could be really quite an interesting novel kind mm -hmm. of approach. So just there, there are like limited things, obviously, that you can do in terms of the problems, an NLP problem or a computer vision problem or something like that. But tweaking it to something that you find interesting, I think, is really the key. And then yeah. it will be unique to you because it will be whatever you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to add that too. So again, yeah, it's true that there's so many projects out there, but it's up to you to determine what your niche is. Like, what do you find most interesting in yourself? What skills do you think is best qualified for you? Whether that's communicating results, being like applying machine learning or having good data visualizations. Um, these projects are very open-ended and it's up to you to actually create that problem for yourself and solve it. That's what they want. They want people that are independent, knowing how to take initiative create a problem for themselves and solve it using data. So if you can get that whole pipeline, like getting the data yourself, creating the questions for yourself to get the right data, and then doing some sort of data task, data science task to come up with a solution, that's like the whole package right there. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think as well that sometimes when people are learning like this stuff like data science, they they tend to focus on what I call the icing on the cake, which is just the, the, the model or just the mm -hmm. algorithm. And, and that's like a, a, a critical mistake because there are uh, literally hundreds of decisions and yeah. there's so, so much work that goes into it that you, you know, and you, you're pretty much done by the time you're thinking of what you're <laughs> like, you know, really. And, and you know, there's just, to be able to see that someone can do that end to end is mm -hmm. hugely important. So there are, there are many times in many settings where you'd gladly take like someone who had pretty good, like good SQL skills and yeah. you could do some like manipulation of data in Pandas or whatever mm -hmm. over some, it was like this guru machine learning expert who yeah. couldn't extract the data from the database kind of thing. Like it's just, you yeah. know, they, they have limited use at the end of the pipeline, but to have someone to go through the entire pipeline and do the plotting and do the exploratory analysis, mm -hmm. hugely valuable. Yeah, I agree. And we have another question from Anonymous. So I am currently working in the finance department as a business intelligence developer. I would like to know how to transit from BI to data science. What can I do at work to, to prepare myself for the transition? Right, I, I would say as well, like depending on the, the, the BI tool that you use, uh, I know Power BI has got some really good R integration as well. Um, so you, you can learn something like R and then trying to do those but those jobs that just are, I mean, you're working with data now, that's an excellent stuff. Mm -hmm. You really not that far away. And so I would be almost, um, well, explain to your boss where you want to go and what you want to do and put your hand up for those 
particular projects. And um, over time, try, try to take more and more of a um, approach using R or using something like that to do some predictive type stuff, some predictive reports or do some exploratory stuff and exploratory plots and, and being able to drill into the data a bit more and work with your boss and your company. Because again, it's, it's hugely valuable. And if someone can do a couple of things, so you can do the BI, yeah plus some predictive modeling, plus some exploratory work. Like that's, again, hugely valuable for the, the company. And so I think have an open discussion and say, this is where you want to, want, to, want to go. And I'm sure that the, the company would support you in that. Yeah. All right, Ina said, can you explain to me how to learn data science in steps? Which skills should we acquire? Because many companies prefer different languages, SAS, Python, R. And if you have any books, can you give me some recommendations? Yeah, well, it's, it's again, that's a pretty uh, general question that yeah. um, would, would almost require a book <laughs> to, to <laughs> explain it. But I, I like the way that you're talking about, Randy, about the, the analytics pipeline. Yeah. I think you have that in your head and that should guide what you need to know. So you're going to mm -hmm. have data in the database, you're going to need to step one, you're going to need to, well, I mean, even before that, you probably need to understand whatever problem domain you're in and to be able to think about good questions and all that sort of stuff. But let's, let's all that for a second. In terms of the actual technical work, you'll have the data in the database and you'll need to um, be able to extract that probably using SQL and you'll mm -hmm. probably need to um, manipulate that and clean it using a scripting language of some type, either R or Python. And you'll need to be able to do some exploratory plots and some investigation. And then you may, you'll need to be able to do some um, modeling of that. And you'll need to be able to, you know, have to take a, a, a probably this research approach. So that's um, using R Markdown or, or whatever, or, or Python notebooks or Jupyter notebook or whatever. And um, then you'll need to be able to put that together and, and communicate it. So that's yeah. kind of stepping out the pipeline and the different sort of steps that you need over time. Like again, for, for R, which is what I learned first, that specialization by those guys at the um, at Johns Hopkins, um, the data science specializations, that was the end-to-end -end pipeline. Like mm -hmm. that, was, yeah. that was amazing. Like that was really, really good. And there was another, another one as well, which um, I, I did a while ago, and that was uh, a Python, sim similar idea in Python, Python specialization. Um, now, what was, I can't remember the name of that. Applied, uh, applied data science with Python or something like that. It was called, I think, on course. Mm -hmm. And so, either one of those two would be pretty good for going all the way through the pipeline. And so, I, I'd be looking at those two. Got it. Yeah, I would like to add this. So, from all these like interviews I talked to you and all of the past speakers, I've seen something that's very similar in regards to skill set. So, I would like to break this down for you guys from what I've learned from everybody here. So, there's five things that I, I see a lot. And again, since data science is so broad, I want you guys to just focus on the fundamentals. That's what everyone t tells me. And these fundamentals include, so the fundamental language, whether that's R, Python, or SQL, these are the fundamental languages for you to do all your data cleaning, your data modeling, um, visualizing, and like data management. So that's, that's one of the fundamentals. The other one is, maybe the core machine learning algorithms. If you can understand linear logistic regression, naive Bayes, the, like the grandfathers of uh, machine learning, having that foundation allows you to grasp the other harder concepts easier. So focus on that. And again, data science is a science on how you can answer problems through data. So a lot of them say, having that skill on knowing how to ask the right questions, that's really important. And that really differentiates the good data scientists from the bad. Knowing what questions to answer, knowing what questions or knowing how to get those solutions from those questions. And then the next one is communication. So your soft skills, learning how to communicate things in a very simple manner, that's huge. And that's something that's not seen a lot in the STEM field. So if you, are, if you are a public speaker, I really emphasize you learning how to communicate. Maybe you just talk in a mirror, record yourself because it's gonna help you out in the long run. And the last but not least, I hear this all the time. It's, um, they say curiosity and like empathy. So data science is like a people skill. You'll be interacting with either your clients, your teammates, and you're gonna be constantly working with these people. So knowing how to talk to people and understanding what problems they have, and understanding like to be in their shoe, that gives you a good leverage on how to 
um, approach these problems and get your solutions. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that's my, my uh, from what I learned from everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another question. So from Yizu, as a new student, if I want to engage in the regulatory technology and financial industry in the future, what knowledge should I focus on except for the general courses I will learn from the university? Right. I, yeah, I, I think this space is going to be absolutely huge. Um, reg tech. And again, my, my background in banking, like this is going to be absolutely massive. Um, mm -hmm. So um, what... And again, it does depend on, on, on what you're looking at and what area of, uh, of reg tech you're kind of, kind of looking at as well. Um, look, I, I think it's, it's probably a, a place where there's going to be some, some specialist type blogs and stuff like that that you're probably going to be able to pick up to be able to work out the techniques and the problems that are happening in that space at the moment. Um, I, I know a bit about what's happening in banking. There's a banking royal commission happening over here in Australia because all the banks have been doing dodgy lending. Like, you know, well, not all of them, just most of them. But <laughs> and, um, so there's going to be a, a huge, um, uh, that's going to be hugely important over here in, in, the, um, in the coming years. Interestingly as well, it's, it's kind of a good time for fintechs and stuff to get going because like they're just, there's so much red tape over banking, mm -hmm. well, which is kind of interesting. Um, so yeah, I, I would say as well, you probably need to get to looking at what is happening in the reg tech space right now. And there are conferences, there are there are fields. Uh, there's, there's, I think there's even a, a course. I think there's also like a, on there that was like a legal tech kind of course that was on Coursera or something like that. But I reckon looking at that, it's so looking at, at MOOCs, looking at blogs, looking at recent papers that have come out in that space because the stuff that you pick up at uni is going to give you a good background, but it's not going to tell you what the current issues are. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, for instance, for me, like I am, I saw, I saw as well that what, what happens with most banks, right? Is you put in your application form information and they'll, they'll pick about six or seven variables. They'll have some credit bureau information and then they'll do a logistic regression model to work out if you're going to be a good or bad risk. And that's it, right? That's kind of it that's happening in Australia at the moment. What's going to happen is that, well, for short-term short lending, 90 days of bank statements is a requirement at the moment for short-term lending. Now, I can see that being a requirement for all lending, like to make use of the data that's available. Because you can see if someone's got a problem, a gambling problem, if they've got a tax liability, if they're using debt to pay up a debt, you can see, you can really part their entire financial life and see if their, their regularity of their income, you can see everything and you can make the best decision for them. And so I can see that in banking in the reg tech space, that's going to be really, really important. Um, at, at the moment, we're not there. And in fact, one of the biggest banks in Australia came out and said, that's impossible. Believe me, it's possible. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so that's a problem in, in banking, but have a look at, at um, the different problems that are around because there, there are going to be some interesting ones and you you could actually have like an ai startup with, with an algorithm from one solving a problem i think you can make a lot of money in this space mm -hmm. oh, okay this should be a fun one so can you define data science in one single sentence i'm a novice i don't even know what the d of data science means <laughs> i'm yeah okay I, I've gone with this definition before and because yeah. it's, it's a one sentence and it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's, it's broad and it's general, but I, I see data science as using the internal data assets of a company to help it achieve its strategic goals. Yeah. That's Got just it. one yeah. sentence, very general, missing a lot. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to have like a one sentence on a t-shirt, <laughs> That might be something like that, right? Yeah, I want to take a step at this. Um, if I were to say one sentence for data science, I would say to keep it very simple, it's is it using data to solve problems at the most basic? And again, remember the main role as a data scientist or anything is you're a problem solver. So you find a problem and you get data and do whatever with it to just answer it at the most yep. most high level case. And you have to remember that there are, there are dudes that are paying your bill as well, like they're paying your salary. So 
it's kind of like um, show me the money type stuff, like Jerry uh, and the prize happening as well at the same time. That's the yeah, that's the only thing I'd say is that because um, again, you don't want to have go down a path and do something really interesting mm-hmm. because it's not the PhD. It still comes back to creating yeah. money or saving money or something money. Where's the money at? That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have another question from Paramo. What do you think about the certificates you get from Udemy, Udacity, and Coursera? How do recruiters and hiring managers treat them? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I, I, I see value in them. I, I, I do, I do mm-hmm. see value in, in them and in, in the right ones. Um, I think it would, again, depend on the different recruiter. What, what it does to me is it serves as a signal saying this person yeah. really willing to put in some time to learn this stuff. Yeah. So, in my point of view, I see it as awesome. Like, mm-hmm. but again, not everyone thinks the same way as me. Randy, you're more in this space. What, what are your- <laughs> Yeah, so um, again, what Nick says, it's a good initiative. So when people are looking through your resume and when they see these courses listed, yeah, at first glance, at the very least, they know you're trying and you're showing, you're showcasing your interest in the field, taking the initiative to learn on your own. So that's one. But again, um, since you have so many of these certificates, they might be a little inflated. Everybody's doing it. So you have to get out of the majority and do something beyond doing these courses. Because again, everyone's doing it. You're just a part of the herd. And to yeah. be different, to be known or to be like recognized, you have to go away from the herd a little bit and do something your own. Whether that's a project, doing your own thing, networking, you have to stand out in some way. But other than that, this, that's a good stepping stone for the field. So don't, just because I'm saying all of this, I'm not saying don't take it. Um, this is a good leeway in getting your footsteps into understanding what it's going to be like in the field, what to prepare yourself for. And yeah, that's, that's my takeaway. Yeah, I've, well, in the past as well, when I've done Coursera courses, I've, I've mainly like ordered them because I'm too cheap to pay. But yeah. um, the it, it is pretty good value for money and maybe yeah, it is financial, financial yeah. aspect of throwing the money down maybe that's an extra incentive it's like if you go to the gym and you throw down money, money to you, you're going to go yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah true that yeah. okay so we have another question from um, from murthy uh, i think we answered this already but what exactly does a data scientist do I think we, if you want to take a stab at it again really quick. Yeah. Like I, I think you, you've got business problems and yeah. you've got data and you're trying to use them as best you can to give some insight or hopefully solve whatever problems coming mm-hmm. up. Um, and you, and whether that's exploratory plotting, whether it's a predictive model, whether it's just uh, reporting, you, you're doing something with the data to create like this data driven approach to answering mm-hmm. the business problem. Got it. I mean, data is the ultimate authority. It doesn't matter what the CEO or what me. Or yeah. Me if you've got data backing you, then you're mm-hmm. uh, the ultimate. Uh, it's the ultimate check of, of that intuition and, and that business rationale. Got it. So we have a question from Braylon. I am a second year computer science undergrad in California. Oh, hey, okay. I'm here too. <laughs> uh, and I'm planning to get my master's degree. If my goal is to be a data scientist in those big companies like Google, do you suggest me in getting a PhD instead of a master's? Well, Randy, you, you know more about the market over there. Yeah. I think this one's for you. Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, I have a story to tell about these big companies. So recently, last month, I had an interview with Google. No way. All, yeah, all through networking. Hmm. Long story short, I didn't get the job, but... From my insights on what these big companies look for, this is my takeaway and what I've learned. So these big companies, I talked to the HR, they said they get 2 million or whatever, they get a lot of resumes per year. Wow. And what they look for in candidates that differentiates from the rest, from the rest of the herd, is again, like what they told me was, they really look for people that go out and beyond because if you think of it, all these resumes look the same. All these buzzwords, these skills, everything that he listed. So what they look for is more of the, the extracurriculars. Like what have you done? Something that's unique, something different. 
That's the key word, different. And what these big companies do, whether it's Google, Facebook, Airbnb, their main hiring process is normally the same. Um, if you think about it, these big companies, they work with big, 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 big loads of data. So large scale data. And at the very least, you gotta have some understanding on how to deal with those data. So these questions that they ask you, you have to know programming at the, at the very least, some computer science background. Because these are software engineering companies and the interview that I went through, they asked me a programming question involving Python. So you gotta, my advice, we, you, we can talk more. My advice would be to practice the medium to hard problems on lead code because that's mostly what they're gonna ask you. It's very complicated programming questions. You have one hour, you and the software engineer, she's gonna, she or he is gonna give you the code and you're gonna have, to, it's very open. So this is where they gauge you on how you talk, how you ask questions to even answer the, the question. So it's a mutual, mutual talk. And they also gauge on how you code, how neat your code is, how organized it is, and if you can solve the problem. So it's coding and a lot of talking. That's my advice on that. That is a, <laughs> I would literally be crying. I got, I, it was, I yeah, I had a great experience, but yeah, cool. I need to work on my programming background. So that's my advice to you. <laughs> I think to be intense with someone like over your shoulder like that. Like, <laughs> yeah, it was intense. It was an hour of me and her on um, Skype. It was just a blank Google Doc and I had a, have fun with that. That was my ID, a Google Doc. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Right. Yeah, we can talk more on that. But <laughs> so another question we have is from Mohammed. Um, most data scientists are sp spending a lot of time data cleaning and preparing. Is it correct? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. I mean, I've never had even even when someone prepares like you know a, a modeling data set or something for you. It's it's going to be wrong, right? <laughs> it's going to be yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing the modeling. So, um, so yeah, you you need to check. Even at the very least, right? You have you have if, if there's like a consulting project or something you've done, yeah. you've got some exploratory uh, data analysis type code that you run through, and you go, hang on, we've had you know three months months of, of the same month in the data set. What's going on? Like, mm -hmm. there's always problems, and and when you've got different systems and they're in different places and they're talking to each other and combining it and working out what to join onto what, like it's, it's a mess. It, it really is. And even just understanding how to get some kind of crazy view of a customer, that's hard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Again, you've probably seen, seen this sort of stuff happening at Brandy as well. Yeah, I agree on Nick. And what I would like to say too is don't think of data cleaning and preparation as a negative thing, because if you think about it, when you're going through this process, you're taking the time to learn about your data, oh, which, yeah. is, which is huge. Yeah. So you're analyzing all your columns, you're understanding what you're even working with to even get the job done. So don't think of it as a, as a, like a, as a chore, it's a requirement. It's kind of fun actually. It yeah. is, it is fun. Like when you, and like, again, like um, Wes McKinney in, in his book, Python for Data Analysis, he does talk about that people don't use functions often enough, like their own mm -hmm. customers for doing data cleaning. And he thinks that's a real like negative thing. And, <laughs> and it can really be a lot of fun when you're writing your own sort of functions to clean your own yeah. data. And it's like, oh, this is, this is sick. This is great. I'm, I'm, I'm cleaning data. And it's, uh, it's not, well, it is kind of painful, but it's still, it's, it's, you can get fun out of it. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from Harshita. After cleaning, analyzing, and training, and testing your data, and getting the accuracy we need, can you tell me how we can like deploy it? Yeah. Okay. So it, it really depends on now. I've I've seen models deployed in many different places. So this these were the bad old days. Okay. I'm going to take you back to the the early 2000s, right? And um, <laughs> the the way that oh, mid 2000s. The way that this happened was um, you, oh, you still there? Sorry, something's come up. Oh, you can still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Cool. cool. Okay. Sorry. So the way this would happen is you do like a a model and you have your coefficient values and it would be a regression of some type and they would take those coefficient values and hard code them into SQL, into a SQL server, into like, like a, you know, some kind of transaction thing. So that when someone hit the website with the new data, boom, it would hit this SQL code and then that would output 
uh, a prediction based off you know, summing up those coefficient values for these different features. That was the bad old days and that was, that was horrible. And the other way that, that it used to happen was that it would be a direct translation. So you'd have like, again, some, some R code or some Python code, and that would be directly translated over to C sharp. And that again was horrible. Like, yeah, and, but in the last few years, we're getting so much better at this sort of stuff. I mean, uh, Microsoft Azure, like that kind of thing, you can, you can use. The, also, there's um, SQL, uh, well, there's R, R is, uh, models can be integrated into SQL Server, which is great. And you can even also just set up like a, a Flask sort of web app in Python, and you can just sort of uh, deploy as, as, an, as an API, which a service that, that's sort of called. Um, and, and that's, again, a much better way to do it. So we're getting, we're getting much better at, at deploying, uh, mm -hmm. deploying models. And there's, there's other solutions ar ar around as well. But it's not like the bad old days where you have to kind of reinvent the wheel to deploy. It's, and if you're using Python, like, I mean, I, I like R, and I like Python as well, but Python for model deployment is just, yeah, so much better. Because, I mean, you just sort of integrated in. It's, it, it, it's just like another thing. It's just like another service that runs in your, in your, in your website. Got it. Uh, we have a question from Nikhil. So he said, I'm not too comfortable with R, but is it necessary to learn both R and Python? Um, <clears throat> I think when, when you're starting out, no, I, I don't think so. And um, again, I, I started out with, with R because I mm. didn't have a programming background. And then I moved over to Python as I learned more programming. And um, you know you can go the other way, or you, you don't have to, because everything you can do in one, you can do in the other. Um, mm. R, R has got really good visuals. It's got really good libraries. It's really good for rapid prototyping. It's really good for doing stuff quickly. And so that's what I like about it. it also has really good um, reproducible research um, type. Uh, well, it's a really good ecosystem for reproducible research. Uh, Python, you can still do all those things. Uh, reproducible research is a little bit harder, but you can still do it. Mm -hmm. um, Python works really well with text. Python for, for deep learning AI is awesome. Yeah. Um, so you, you kind of, you, you don't want to be, when you're kind of more senior, you don't want to be bound by a certain technology. Yeah. You want to be able to do whatever. And again, yeah, Randy, you probably have yeah. a point of view. Of that. Yeah. So again, Nick made a great point and I just learned this recently from Ben Taylor on LinkedIn. If you guys haven't checked him out, his name is Ben Taylor, Deep Learning. He made a really, really great point on the, the difference between R and Python. So he said R stands for research. So if you're into research, feel free to learn R. And then P for Python stands for production. So if you're into production, whether that's modeling, deploying things, um, doing very flexible things that R can do, Python is your go-to. But in the end, these are just tools in your tool belt. Remember that, whether that's R, Python, you're just using these tools for you to answer your question. So it really depends on what you wanna do, but my advice is pick one, learn as a language, don't switch around too much because you're gonna confuse yourself. So learn as a language and once that's done, you can feel free to move on to the next, it'll be easy. And we're gonna end it in about five, five to 10 minutes. So maybe two more questions. So from Aaron, leaving success of data science aside for a minute, do you want to sh share something that's not possible with data science? Something that's not possible. Um, well, I'm, I'm pretty uh, <laughs> optimistic about like data science to be, you know, for, um, for solving you know, a, a lot of problems. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but I think there's no, there's no place for reasonableness checks. When something comes out of a, a, a model, um, looking through examples and testing out individual cases and then doing a human reasonableness check. Uh, also running your data across uh, sub subpopulations that you're particularly concerned with um, mm -hmm. to make sure you're not disadvantaging certain groups that you particularly care about. Um, that sort of stuff is really important because the model is just going to train itself on whatever past decisions were. So if you were making past decisions in a way that disadvantages a certain group, then the model is going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's always going to be that need for human in interpretation and understanding of the results of the model. So um, that's what I think. I think a, a model is brilliant and, gen and genius, but it's also really dumb at the same time. <laughs> yeah. So, 
yes. whatever happened in the past will happen in, or it will predict it's gonna happen in the future. Mm -hmm. you just be aware of that. So one question, this is about hypothesis testing. So Anor asked, what is the role of making a hypothesis before diving in? So, a, a hypothesis. A hypothesis so, for instance, uh, again, pretty gen general question, but I'm I'm guessing you, you're probably thinking something like a, or like, you know, is this going to be a significant result, or is it, or maybe I'm A/B split testing yeah. a, a certain website uh, a certain page on a website and i've done like a few test and i want to have a look and to see uh, which whether my, my clients prefer blue screens or whether they prefer red uh, like mm -hmm. a, a red background or something like that and having a threshold for what you think a significant result is is important um, because you want to be able to run the experiment and then determine which one's winning fairly quickly and accurately so that you can then make money <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, i'd say I, I, again and maybe i'm not getting your, your question right but that's kind of the the idea with the hypothesis mm -hmm. is this result significant you know and in in the context of a b split testing let's switch it off let's go with one's profitable and let's let's all drive teslas got it so two more questions i can choose one and then if you want you can look through the list and answer any as well but for my final one, so this is more about, this is from Jennifer Cooper. Oh, hi, Jennifer. I see you all the time on LinkedIn as well. <laughs> so she said, so let's talk about the business problem and explain machine learning's application in terms of how business people can understand. I had to do this at my company and, oh, never mind. This is just an, an answer. Sorry. I thought it was oh, a question. Cool. But you, we can talk about that using machine learning in the business sense? Really hard. <laughs> really hard sometimes to explain to people. Like I, and this is gonna sound bad, but I have a couple of kids. You know, mm -hmm. you, you met before, Randy. I've, I've got yeah. two children, seven, eight years old. Okay. <laughs> and I sometimes explain things in the same way that I'm talking to my kids without patronizing, but assuming mm -hmm. that they don't have the background that I've had. It's really hard because if you've grown up in stats and you've been doing math for a long time, it's really hard to come in and assuming that they know nothing because what you think is nothing is, you know, you're still making assumptions there. Now with my kids, it's really hard as well because they are a couple of days ago, we wrote a Python code to simulate dice rolls together. Oh, and wow. Okay. Yeah. Like they've, they're totally down with concepts of sampling law of large numbers. They've totally down with that stuff. <laughs> So when I'm explaining stuff at the level of a kid, I've got to even drop down further sometimes, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that. It's, that's, yeah. So I, I still have trouble with this sometimes. I really mm -hmm. do. But you do need to have someone like a sounding board. And that someone is usually like my wife, who mm -hmm. um, is like, uh, has a, a nursing background. She can code a bit. She, she can build websites and stuff. So uh -huh. even that. Awesome. Uh, to, to bounce it off someone and say, hey, does this make sense? Like, really important. Because again, you, you and, and anyone that's, that's had any sort of background in the field is going to get it. But someone who's completely new won't even understand what a sample is, what a random yeah. sample is. Yeah. I, I ran into a couple a couple of days ago, just trying to explain drawing things out of a hat and random sampling. And mm -hmm. It's really hard to explain to someone who's yeah. never heard of the concept before. So I just like to add to that. That just goes back to, again, the power of communication. If you can explain it in the most simplest case, that's a powerful skill that you can have that not a lot of people can do. So again, like if you can explain and dumb it down to a five-year-old, three-year-old, six-year-old, you have a skill to make important or very hard topics into something simple and easy. And that's what people need. So when you're doing these models, when you're doing all these tests, all these fancy lingos, terminologies, Many of the people that you're working with, whether that's your manager or your boss, they really just want you to answer questions in a most generic sense. Something very simple. And they care about money. They care about dollars. Yeah. If you can express it in Exactly. <laughs> so so what like what Nick said, if you can turn data into dollars, that's what they're that's what they want. <laughs> but yeah, that's about it. If you have any last words, Nick Ryan, to the audience. 
Uh, no, I just, uh, um, again, Randy, thanks for the opportunity. And yeah, also, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I'd encourage everyone to be active on LinkedIn and uh, ask me, uh, you know, Randy, like Kate, mm -hmm. and others, any questions. And, um, yeah, we do have lives and we do have things we're doing but we try to answer them as best as best we as best we can and um yeah and that's the thing the power of the network just if there's one key takeaway it yes. is network yes. meet people like i met randy he's over the other side of the world yeah, i met nick <laughs> a few months ago and <laughs> and now we're connected across the world yeah so it's amazing like yeah and you know you've, you've always got a job over here champ but it's, it's no problem i'll, I'll work, work with you Mm -hmm. I've got a spare room just there. If you want to, if you want to crash, it's cool. Like, it's totally cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I sent out a poll for everybody. If you can take one minute out of your time, we we're trying to get this webinar to a higher standard. So your feedback is crucial. So if you can take that time, but in the meantime, I just want to say thank you, Nick, so much for all your insights, for everything you're doing for the community. That's Our team here, like ideas, we really appreciate it. Like, so we really appreciate it. I have to say that again. <laughs> it's, all, it's all you man like honestly i think you're absolutely fabulous randy it's, it's thank real, you real and then other than yeah other than that thanks everybody for attending and i just want to say the networking thing reach out ask questions you don't know how important and how like what do you call it you'll be surprised how many people are there to help you out just ask the question tag us message us because in the end we're just here to help out we're here to contribute back so you can do that for yourself. Give back to get back in a way. But other than that, thank you so much. Hopefully for our next one, we might get Caden. So that's a little, um, a little um, foreshadowing. <laughs> that, awesome. yeah. yeah. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Have a good weekend. I right, see you guys. See ya.